Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to my solo 401k financials webinar going over 401k business financing. Thanks, everyone, for joining. My name is George Blower. I'm, uh, I'm the general counsel of my solo 401k financial. Today's session is being recorded. Um, it's, today's objective is really just educational, so we're not going to be given any type of investment advice or legal advice or anything of that nature. And really, the, the PowerPoint is geared at a high level. But if anyone has any specific questions, um, of course, you're free to contact us. at. Um, you can contact me at George at MySolo401k.net or call us at 1-800-489-7571. The contact information is right there on the screen. Or you can bring it up in this call if, if, you, if you'd like to. We'd, we'd welcome that type of feedback on the call. So um, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, I am going to uh, unmute everybody so that you can jump in. Again, we don't want to, we want to encourage that. So thanks again for joining and uh, we'll get started. So let's go through an overview of the topics that we're going to talk about this morning. Uh, we're going to talk about what is a Rob's 401k? Am I eligible to set up a Rob's 401k? So eligibility, uh, what type of retirement funds you can roll over? What is the process? So it's step by step. What is the process to fund my business? Um, how do I get money out of this business? You know, can I receive a salary? Do I have to offer the plan to employees? What are the ongoing costs and requirements? And what are the exit strategies? So a lot of good information that will, um, you know, you would want to consider before you decided to go down this path. So let's start with the basics. What is a ROBS 401k? Uh, ROBS is really just an acronym for rollover as business startup. That's the terminology that the IRS has used. Um, our plan is called a 401k business financing plan. Other people have different names for it, marketing terms, that kind of thing. The, that terminology came out of an IRS memo back in 2008, which was really the landmark guidance from the IRS that did a couple of things. I mean, it clarified they viewed it as a legitimate uh, means, a legitimate transaction. I'm sorry, we're getting a little bit of feedback, so I'm going to go ahead and mute. We can unmute at the end, give people a chance to ask questions at the end. Thank you. The, um, again, the terminology rollover is business startup. It comes from an IRS memo back in 2008 um, where they went over sort of the, you know, the regulatory expectations really highlighted risks, both in terms of investment risk, compliance risks, you know, the investment risk, of course, being that you're investing your retirement money in your own business and, you know, the business might not work out. Uh, compliance risks in terms of things that they had identified where people weren't uh, necessarily following the rules or the regulatory expectations. What a Rob's 401k is allowing you to do, as stated in that third <clears throat> book, is to fund your business with your retirement money without paying taxes or penalties. So you're really able to access a significant amount of money to fund a business without having to pay what oftentimes might be 30 or even 40%, which you add in the 10% penalty to take a withdrawal, along with the income taxes that you would have to pay on that once the you know, once you take that money out and it's considered income in the year that you take it out. As a result of that, oftentimes you're able to minimize or even avoid debt, which can really be instrumental for a new business, right? A growing business. Um, if you're able to avoid taking on that debt, um, it can really allow you to achieve success with your business. So that's, at the end of the day, that's the real primary benefit of the plan. Uh, there are going to be some other ancillary benefits in terms of you have a 401k, which can be attractive to employees that you might have in your business. Um, the point of this, as in the next slides, we're, now we're going to go into the process and really some of the, not necessarily the cost, but things that you're going to have to take on. It's not as simple as just setting up a plan, funding your business and forgetting about it. As stated in that IRS memo, there are a lot of important ongoing compliance requirements. So we're going to definitely get into those as well. So let's go on to the next slide. 
am I eligible to set up a ROBS 401k? So here we're going to talk about the technical eligibility requirements as well as some other considerations that may, even though you might be technically eligible to do it, it may not be practical. So in terms of uh, the first bullet, operating company. So the business that you want to fund, it needs to be an operating company. Typically, that's going to be a business that's providing goods or services, right? There is a way to do it with a real estate operating company, although there's some special requirements that apply in that, in that scenario. So think a franchise or an independent type of goods or services business. That's going to be sort of your classic business that's being funded through this vehicle. So you cannot set up a business that's just going to be an investment type of business, right? You're buying and selling stock. That's not an operating company. You're not selling goods or services. Another area that could not qualify would be some type of a lending business. Again, you're not providing goods or services. So it does need to, be, does need to meet that operating company requirement. You also need to be an employee. Typically, the way that's measured is working at least a thousand hours. That's definitely going to be a best practice in the in the business. So, you could not just use this vehicle to set up a business for your son or something like that, or a family member, or your fiance, whatever it might be. You know, if you have X number of dollars in an IRA and your son is looking to get a business started, this is not going to be a vehicle to to help your son set up his business. You've got to be active in the business. You've got to be an employee. You could use it to buy a business. Now, in that case, you would have to buy a business from an unrelated person. So you're not going to be able to buy a business from your father. You know, if your father's trying to retire and trying to get out of his business, you cannot use this as a, as a vehicle to fund the purchase of the business from your father. So it's got to be an unrelated person you've got to have certain type of retirement accounts. Now, the vast majority of retirement accounts are going to be eligible, and we've got a whole slide dedicated to that. We're going to talk about that next, but it does have to be an eligible retirement account. And again, we'll talk about that in a moment. In terms of the other considerations, so even if you get through all these hoops and you qualify, other things that you might want to think about is the amount invested. If you're really not looking to use enough money it may not make sense because, again, going back to the previous slide, the benefit is the fact that you're saving on taxes and penalties, right? So the more that you are accessing, the more that you're saving, right? So if you're not accessing that much money, if you're looking to access ten or $20,000 or $30,000, it very well may not make sense to use this vehicle because of the compliance requirements you got to take on, the costs that you have to take on. There may be other vehicles that might, might make sense. And we could talk about that your, in your specific situation. Another consideration is, are the control group rules. So if you are a serial entrepreneur or you already have a business, right, with employees, and now you want to set, you found out about this and you want to set up another business and it's an unrelated business in terms of the business activity, but you have an existing business with employees, those employees are going to be considered employees for purposes of the 401k plan that we're going to be setting up. And so those employees are going to have to be given a chance to participate in this new 401k, even though it's a totally unrelated business, right? And that's because of special rules, which are called the control group rules, which essentially say if you have two companies, right, that are owned by the same person, meaning you, the employees of any company with it that's part of a control group is going to be considered an employee for purposes of the plan. And so that might make it something that you don't want to pursue just because of having to manage the 401k across all your businesses. Another consideration is other investors. And again, we're going to talk about this in a moment, but one of the things that you have to do is you have to run this through a C corporation. If you have other investors in the picture, they may not want to run this through a C corporation. Their, their preference might be to do it through, say, an S corporation or maybe some type of LLC taxes a partnership, right? And so 
that might make it unattractive to work with to work through this vehicle because it has to be done through a C corporation. So that's going to be another consideration. Um, spouses and children. Your spouses and children can be active in the business. If it's say your money, but your spouses and children are going to be active in the business as as employees, right? That they're you're going to have to be careful that you are not paying them an unre unreasonably high salary and that sort of thing. The other thing to consider is that if those relatives are not bringing money to the table, then they're not going to have any type of ownership interest in the business. So if one spouse has the money, but they say, well, we both want to do this 50, 50, right? In their minds, it's 50, 50. Well, technically speaking, if only one spouse has the money, then the other spouse is not going to have any ownership interest in the business. So those are some other special considerations beyond just the uh, strict eligibility requirements. So let's go on to the next slide. Here we talk about the type of retirement accounts that you're able to roll over into a Rob's 401k. Of course, you've got your uh, all types of IRAs other than Roth IRAs and inherited IRAs. You've got traditional rollover. So you rolled over money from, say, a previous employer or a SEP IRA. A simple IRA, as long as you satisfy the two-year uh, vesting period. You've got uh, former employer plans like 401ks, pensions, thrift savings plans. The way that the money is going to get transferred is via a trustee to trustee transfer or a direct rollover. So it's going from an existing retirement account to your new employer 401k. So it's it's going from one retirement account to another, so it's not going to be a taxable event. It's a reportable event, so whoever holds your retirement accounts today would issue a 1099R in the following year, but it's, going to, it's not a taxable event. So that 1099R should have a code G in box seven to indicate that it went to a qualified plan. Another way that you could theoretically do this is via an indirect rollover, where you take the money out of your existing account and then you have it, you hold it personally, and then you move it over into this plan within 60 days. Now, of course, if you're doing that through an IR, if you're taking it from an IRA because of the recent changes to the rules there, you would only be able to do one of those indirect rollovers once per 12 month period. And of course, if you're taking it out of a, a former employer plan like a 401k, your former employer plan administrator is going to do a 20% withholding. So indirect rollovers are really not ideal. The, we, with our team, the way we work is, of course, we take the lead on that whole transfer process in terms of completing all the paperwork, submitting it to the administrator, just to make sure that that process is very clean and it's, it's not going to be triggering any type of taxable event. Now, the last two bullets talk about plans where you are probably not going to be able to access the money. Well, definitely with the first bullet. I mean, definitely with the last bullet and probably with the first one there. So the first one that I'm referring to is your current employer plan. So most current employer plans are not going to allow you to take your money out until you actually separate from service. Now, there are some exceptions if you're uh, nearing retirement, if you transfer the money from a, a previous employer plan. Yeah, then you very well may be able to access it. And some plans do even allow you to take in-service take in service transfers, meaning while you're still employed, allow you to transfer it out. But the vast majority do not. So you, if your money is in your current employer plan and you accumulated it there while you were employed, you're very likely going to have to to leave your job before you can move the money over into this Rob's 401k. And so that can create a timing issue, right? where it might take you a month after you leave before you can even fund the business. And so from a timing perspective, that might not be what your ideal scenario is. The last bullet there talks about Roth IRAs and inherited IRAs. Those are types of accounts that you're not going to be able to access in order to fund the business. Because of the IRA rules, they're just not going to allow it. So those are going to be off the table. So let's go on to the next slide. Here we're going to go over the process to fund my business. What is the process to fund my business? So really it's a 
two-step process in terms of the transfer of the money. First of all, uh, a corporation is established and then a corporate bank account is set up. That's the company that's ultimately going to be funded with the retirement money. That's the bank account that's ultimately where the money's going to land. But it's not going to go directly into that account. It first has to be first has to go into an account in the name of a new 401k plan. So that corporation is going to adopt a 401k plan and you are going to be an employee of that company. Remember we said one of the requirements is you got to be an employee. So as an employee on day one, you're eligible to participate in that 401k. And so what you're going to do is you're going to transfer your money over. Like we talked about as a trustee to trustee transfer or a direct rollover into your new 401k plan. And so the money first has to go into an account in the name of the 401k plan for your benefit. Now that account, the basic requirements is it needs to be at a financial institution. So it could be at a bank or it could be at a brokerage. Our team's process is we work, I mean, we work with a number of banks and brokerages, but what we typically do is we would establish an account at Fidelity. It's going to be a brokerage account over there. So it's not a 401k that's provided by Fidelity. It's provided by us. So Fidelity's role is to be the custodian of the cash that's in the account. So the money would first go over to that account at Fidelity. And then once it clears, it's going to be wired over to that corporate bank account. And what you're doing is you're actually buying stock in your new employer. So you're buying stock in that new corporation. So you're going to end up owning a large percentage of the company's stock through your 401k. So, you know, you might roll over $200,000 and invest $100,000 in the company. And then you, end, you own, say, 100,000 shares of that new company. And the stock is issued, so the corporate records there, the stock is issued to the 401k for your benefit. Now, if your spouse also has, let's say you're, you've got somebody else in the picture, let's say it's your spouse, and they have retirement money as well, it's an eligible type of account, they're going to be active in the business, they're going to have their own separate brokerage account. So the money, your spouse's money would go into that account, and the same process is going to be wired over to the corporate bank account, and then stock would be issued to the 401k for your spouse's benefit. Ultimately, once the money hits that corporate bank account, you can start using it right away for legitimate business purposes. Um, the timing for the whole process oftentimes takes about three to four weeks, although it can vary. Your biggest X factor in terms of timing is where the money's coming from and the time it takes for it to be released and transferred over. You know, if you have, a, if you have an IRA at Fidelity and your, the new account is at Fidelity, it could take as little as maybe just a couple weeks, potentially, depending on how quick the corporation is set up and, um, you know, then, and then the new brokerage account is set up because then it's just going to be an internal transfer at Fidelity. But if you're talking about moving your money over from your current employer plan, then you're going to likely have to quit first, like we talked about. They might have a 30-day waiting period, theoretically, although most don't. So the point being that it can vary. It's going to depend on the facts and circumstances. You really need that, that whole transfer process can be uh, daunting. You're definitely going to want to work with a team that is well-versed in dealing with all these different companies and all of their different processes and procedures uh, because oftentimes they're not uh, motivated to let that money go. So you want to work with people that can, can na navigate those systems and processes. So that's how the money moves. It first goes from your plan to the new, your, your existing plan to the new plan to the, the business bank account. Okay, let's talk about how you get money out of this business. You know, the question here is, can I receive a salary? So the answer is yes, because you are an employee. Now you don't, you want to limit the salary to a reasonable salary. So if you want to take a salary, you can, but it should be reasonable. Now, the whole notion of a reasonable salary is obviously a vague concept, right? Which is good and bad. I mean, it's good in the sense that the regulators are not dictating how much money you can make, right? 
but you don't have certainty and definite, you know, it's not black and white in terms of whether what you're making is reasonable. The way that they think about it is from a market perspective. So let's say that you decided to do this business as a, just a passive investment, right? Let's say that you wanted to open up a food truck, right? And let's say you hired me just for instance, right? You know, how much would you have to pay me to run the business? You know, you're going to keep doing what you're doing and you're going to invest in this business. How much would you have to pay me to run the business? You might say, well, George, you know, we're going to pay you X as a base. And then if you do a great job, we're going to give you some incentive compensation. Um, and so you could take that same approach with your salary. The, the issue is if you get into an unreasonably high salary and thinking about that same food truck scenario with me, I mean, I might do a great job. I'm getting my base, I'm getting my incentive, but at some point you're going to say, look, I'm investing all this money. We either need to keep it in the business or it's got to come back to me as the owner. We're not going to just give you George all the profits, right? So it, think about it the same way from a 401k perspective, right? From a 401k perspective, you own the vast majority of this company through your 401k. And so that those profits should be either coming back to the owners, in which case they would go back in accordance with the ownership percentages, right? So if you, if you invest, say, $10,000 of personal money um, into the company and $90,000 of retirement money, so you own this business 90-10, you know, if $50,000 comes out as profit, 90% of it needs to go back to the 401k because you own 90% of the company through your 401k. So that would go back to that fidelity account. And that's going to grow on a tax deferred basis. Whereas 10% would come to you personally because you own 10% of the company personally. So those profits need to either go back to the owners in accordance with the ownership percentages, or they can stay in the business, right? The, the earnings can be retained. You could, you could say, you know what, well, we're going to open up a second food truck. So you could try to grow the business or we're going to create a website or we just want to keep it in the business, you know, keep it in the bank account for a rainy day. So you can send it back to the owners as profits. You can keep it in the business. Um, another thing we'll talk about at the end is exit strategies, but those, th those are the two ways you're really getting money out of the business. You're taking it out as salary, right? In which case it's going to be paid to you as W2 wages, as long as it's a reasonable salary or it's coming out as, pro, as a profit distribution, but that means it's gonna go out in accordance with the ownership percentages, so probably the most, of the most of that money is going back to your 401k account as a dividend on the stock that you own inside your 401k. Now, startup expenses, if you've already paid money to get this business going, right, say out of your checking account, you may think, hey, I'm gonna be working with George, we're gonna fund this business, and I'm gonna get that money back. You don't want to do that. You don't want to get reimbursed because that's going to look like that. That could be a compliance red flag. So instead is you would count that those startup expenses as, as part of your personal investment. So you're going to end up getting stock in exchange for that investment. All right, let's go on to the next slide. Do I have to offer the plan to employees? And the answer is yes, if they're eligible. So that, of course, begs the question, well, what are the eligibility requirements? Now, typically, you know, for the vast majority of our, of our clients, I mean, there is flexibility with our plans. You know, our plan's a profit-sharing plan. It's an IRS-approved plan. Um, it does allow for some customization, of course, but with the vast majority of uh, people would do is they'll go with the standard eligibility requirements, which are going to be W-2 employees who are working at least a thousand hours a year and that have been there for a year. So they have to have a year of service. Once those employees meet those eligibility requirements, the company needs to offer those employees a chance to participate in the plan. And we assist in that regard in terms of just in terms of our process, you know, in terms of documenting that they were given a chance to participate. And if you have employees that want to participate, then 
they would get their own account, you know, where their 401k funds are at. You know, they'd have their own account at Fidelity, their own brokerage account. And then they're going to be able to invest via that account. So they'll be able to invest through the options that are available under that brokerage account, which is going to be a wide range of options. The, the other issue to point out is in terms of the, uh, you know, having a 401k plan based on feedback from a lot of our clients, a lot of them um, have found that it's actually a very powerful employee retention tool. You know, they might be in an industry where there isn't really 401k plans. And so being able to attract and retain employees is something that is very important to their business. Um, it can be costly to go out there and try to recruit more employees in, in terms of resources and just the cost to do so, the time. So having a way to keep those employees sticky is certainly something that um, keep to retain those employees is something that they find attractive in the long run. So what are the ongoing costs and requirements? So in, ter there's a, in terms of the costs, we can start with the costs. From our perspective, and I think what you'll find with any company in the industry, there's gonna be ongoing annual fees to maintain the 401k. Uh, our company charges $500 per year. It's starting in the second year. And really that's for all, all the ongoing compliance support. So that ongoing compliance support is going to include uh, reporting and filing requirements. For example, there's an annual return that needs to be filed for the plan. It's called a Form 5500. It gets filed with the DOL, Department of Labor, electronically. It's something that we prepare as part of our services. Uh, you've got issues around employees like, like we alluded to before, you know, in terms of needing to be offered a chance to participate in the plan and onboarded. You've got mandatory plan amendments. So as the, you know, the plan's gonna need to be updated as the law changes. So there's a number of ongoing requirements. A lot of it depends on what's going on with the plan. You might be taking a distribution from the plan, in which case there'd be a, a reporting requirement. We'd have to file a 1099R. You might be taking a loan from the 401k, in which case we've gotta document that loan. And we handle all of that in, our, in terms of our services. We handle all of that as part of, um, you know, part of our annual fee there. There's also going to be a valuation requirement. And that's connected to that Form 5500, which, again, is the annual filing for the 401k plan. Because on that report, we need to list the value of the plan assets. And, of course, one of the, you know, one of the main assets of the 401k plan is going to be that company stock. So in order to know how much to report, we need to know how much the business is worth. So the so evaluation is going to be needed. And of course, there's going to be a cost associated with that. You're able to use your own provider or we could facilitate it through different companies in the industry that specialize in preparing those valuations. And then finally, you may have a bonding requirement. You may have to get what's called a fidel, fidel, uh, fidelity bond. So you would need to get that fidelity bond once there are other employees who are eligible to participate in the plan. The theory behind that, just to put some context and color around it, the theory behind that is that you are going to be the trustee of the plan. So that means that you've got access and control to the money that's in the plan. And so if you are, um, you've got other employees that are eligible, might be putting their retirement money in the plan, the bond would, would be there to protect against bad acts committed by you as the trustee, you know, let's say fraud or something like that. So in that case, you'd need to get a bond. Um, a good rule of thumb, given our fees, the valuation, and if you have to get the bond, is probably in a, about twelve to $1,500 a year in terms of ongoing costs to maintain the plan. And that would start in the second year. Okay, so let's go on to the last slide here today. And here we want to flag an exit strategy, some exit strategies. So thinking back to that scenario, right, where there's a, you know, profits that are made, and we talked about different options. You know, the profit could be profits could be sent back to the owners. 
They could be kept in the business. And then a third option is they can actually be used to buy the shares back from the plan. That's, that stock buyback is probably the most common exit strategy. And really what you're doing is the opposite of how you funded the business, right? Initially, you moved money into your 401k plan and you bought stock in this company. Now the company's gonna turn around and buy the stock back from the 401k plan. It would need to buy it back for fair market value at the time of the buyback. So you would wanna have documentation to support that, you know, evaluation to support that. And that makes sense, right? I mean, if you invested in this stock and it goes up, you would think that you, know, you would get more money back when you sell it back to the company. And so this exit strategy is gonna be a scenario where you're still involved in the business, right? You still own the business. You just don't own it anymore through the 401k plan. You know, if, that, if you, the company buys back all the shares from the 401k plan, now you're gonna be the sole owner of the company. So that's probably the most common exit strategy in terms of getting the 401k out from owning. You'd still have a 401k, you just wouldn't be invested in the company anymore. Another ex exit strategy, of course, is selling the business. Now, if you sell the business, more than likely, you're gonna do that as an asset sale. You know, most buyers don't wanna buy a business as a stock purchase, unless there's some special scenario circumstances, they're gonna to wanna to buy it as an asset sale. So in that scenario, the company, the corporation, that C corporation, is going to sell its assets to the buyer, and then now it's gonna have just cash, right? At that point, you are probably gonna wind down that company in which case the it's, company's gonna have to pay back creditors that are owed money. So people that you owe money through the business and the money that's left over is gonna go back to the owners, back to the stockholders, which means if you still own it through the 401k, you know, money's going back to your 401k. The sponsor of the 401k has now been wound down. You know, that corporation has now been dissolved. So the 401k itself needs to be wound down and there's a process that we would guide you through at that point. For example, there's a final 5,500 that we would need to file. And the assets themselves in the plan would need to be transferred over. They could be transferred over to say a new employer plan or they could go over to an IRA. Typically it's gonna to go to an IRA uh, and then the plan would be shut down and that would be it. A third option, probably the least common, is you can you could actually take the stock that's in the 401k as a distribution. So this is similar to the stock buyback in the sense that you still own the business, right? You just don't own it through the 401k. In this scenario, you're not, you're, you are taking the stock out. So it's like a cash distribution, except it's in kind. So you're just taking the stock out of the 401k. But just like any distribution, it is gonna be subject to taxes and possibly penalties. So based on the value of that stock, you'd have to pay taxes and possibly possibly penalties. If you do that now, you know, you own the stock, you still own the business. Um, you just don't own it through the 401k anymore. So that we've come to the end of the, the slides here. I will unmute uh, the folks on the call. So give you give people a chance to ask questions. I don't know if we have any questions. I do appreciate everyone's time and uh, and joining today. We will go ahead. We'll, we actually made a, the recording, like I mentioned at the beginning. So we'll go ahead and share it with everyone. And uh, you, if you have any questions in the meantime, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. Oh, I'm sorry. Was someone trying to ask a question? Who was the dead pelican? Okay. Well, thanks everyone for joining and, and have a great day.